Welcome to the Atlanta Soto Zen Center uh, Sunday Dharma Talk. Today we will be addressing, reciting, and then discussing Pukhansa Zengi, which is variously translated but means something like universally recommended instructions for Zazen or universal promotion for Zazen. Zazen being our way of sitting. Za means sit. In Japanese Zen means Zen or contemplation. So um, the way we will start this is for all of us to recite this together. But rather than chant it, recite it as a chant, where it kind of all runs together in one long stream, I think we'll just read it out. I will sort of set the cadence, and if you can follow my cadence, and, and pretty much try to express what it's saying um, clearly. Okay, So more like a reading. Then, uh, I will go back and make a few comments uh, relative to what I think uh, Master Dogen is saying. This is from 12th century uh, founder of Soto Zen, Dogen, Ehe Dogen Zenji, uh, Zen Master Dogen in 13th century uh, Japan. This is said to be the first tract that he wrote down uh, after returning to China about 1225, when he was about 25 years old, being born in 1200, maybe maybe 27, I'm not a scholar historian, but it's somewhere in there, it's a very young man. About the same age I started practicing Zen, and the same age actually, uh, uh, coincidentally, the Matsuoka Roshi came to uh, America, 27 years old or so. So um, let's read it together. The way, the way, is originally perfect and all-pervading. How could it be contingent upon practice and realization? The true vehicle is self-sufficient. What need is there for our special effort? Indeed, the whole body is free from dust. Who could believe in a means to brush it clean? It is never apart from this very place. What is the use of traveling around to practice? And yet, if there is a hair's breadth deviation, it is like the gap between heaven and earth. If the least like or dislike arises, the mind is lost in confusion. Suppose you are confident in your understanding and rich in enlightenment, gaining the wisdom that knows at a glance, attaining the way and clarifying your mind, arousing an aspiration to reach for the heavens. You are playing in the entrance way, but you are still short of the vital path of emancipation. Consider the Buddha. Although he was wise at birth, the traces of his six years of upright sitting can yet be seen. As for Bodhidharma, although he had received the mind seal, his nine years of facing a wall is celebrated still. If even the ancient sages were like this, how can we today dispense with wholehearted practice? Therefore, put aside the intellectual practice of investigating words and chasing phrases, and learn to take the backward step that turns, turns the light and shines it inward. Body and mind of themselves will drop away, and your original face will manifest. If you wish to realize such, get to work on such right now. For practicing Zen, a quiet room is suitable. Eat and drink moderately. Put aside all involvements and suspend all affairs. Do not think good or bad. Do not judge true or false. Give up the operations of mind, intellect, and consciousness. Stop measuring with thoughts, ideas, and views. Have no designs on becoming a Buddha. How could that be limited to sitting or lying down? At your sitting place, spread out a thick mat and put a cushion on it. 
sit either in the full lotus or half lotus position. In the full lotus position, first place your right foot on your left thigh, then your left foot on your right thigh. In the half lotus, simply place your left foot on your right thigh. Tie your ropes loosely and arrange them neatly. Then place your right hand on your left leg and your left hand on your right palm, thumb tips lightly touching. Straighten your body and sit upright, leaning neither left nor right, neither forward nor backward. Align your ears with your shoulders and your nose with your navel. Rest the tip of your tongue against the front of the roof of your mouth. With teeth together and lips shut, always keep your eyes open and breathe softly through your nose. Once you have adjusted your posture, take a breath and exhale fully. Rock your body right and left and settle into steady, immovable sitting. Think of not thinking. Not thinking. What kind of thinking is that? Non-thinking. This is the essential art of Zazen. The Zazen I speak of is not meditation practice. It is simply the Dharma state of joyful ease, the practice realization of totally culminated enlightenment. It is the koan realized. Traps and snares can never reach it. If you grasp the point, you are like a dragon, gaining the water, like a tiger, taking to the mountains. For you must know that the true Dharma appears of itself, so that from the start, dullness and distraction are set aside. When you arise from sitting, move slowly, and quietly, calmly, and deliberately. Do not rise suddenly or abruptly. In surveying the past, we find the transcendence of both mundane and sacred, and dying while either sitting or standing, have all depended entirely on the power of Zazen. In addition, triggering awakening with a finger, a banner, a needle, or a mallet, and affecting realization with a whisk, a fist, a staff, or a shout. These cannot be understood by discriminative thinking, much less can they be known through the practice of supernatural power. They must represent conduct beyond human seeing and hearing. Are they not a standard prior to knowledge and views? This being the case, intelligence or lack of it is not an issue and make no distinction between the dull and sharp-witted. If you concentrate your effort single-mindedly, that in itself is wholeheartedly engaging the way. Practice realization is naturally undefined. Going forward is, after all, an everyday affair. In general, in our world and others, in both India and China, all equally hold the Buddha seal. While each lineage expresses its own style, they are all simply devoted to sitting. Totally blocked in resolute stability, Although they say that there are 10,000 distinctions and a 1,000 variations, they just wholeheartedly engage the way in Zazen. Why leave behind the seat in your own home to wander in vain through the dusty realms of other lands? If you make one misstep, you stumble past what is directly in front of you. You have gained the pivotal opportunity of human form. Do not pass your days and nights in vain. You are taking care of the essential activity of the Buddha way. Who would waste, take wasteful delight in the spark from a flintstone? Besides, form and substance are like the dew on the grass. The fortunes of life like a dart of lightning, emptied in an instant, vanished in a flash. Please, honored followers of Zen, long accustomed to groping for the elephant, do not doubt the true dragon. Devote your energies to the way of direct pointing at the real. Revere the one who has gone beyond learning and is free from effort. Accord with the enlightenment of all the Buddhas, succeed to the samadhi of the ancestors. Continue to live in such a way and you will be such a person. The treasure store will open of itself and you may enjoy it freely. So thank you, Master Dogen. Um, you probably heard some things in there that resonate on other teachings that you've heard from the Chinese teachings and others. And Master Dogen was known for that, you know, quoting and inserting phrases from uh, uh, the teachings that he had learned. He was quite highly educated in that regard, as we all understand. But he was also a practitioner. He was not just a scholar. And so this is, and when I say just a scholar, no offense to scholars, he was both a practitioner and a scholar. Um, so, um, 
first, let's see if uh, anything stood out for anybody that they would like to bring up and, and uh, have a comment on. Anything? The first thing for me was just what you said. I heard a lot of Xin Xin Ming in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, set that aside, what sounded like other people's teachings. And I think when we moved into the talk about practice, Yep, yep. Not that the other wasn't necessarily, as we all try to absorb those other pieces. I just happen to be sensitive to it because I'm trying to, it's uh, working with Chin Chin Meng. Yes, yes. Many, many uh, expressions in there from. So, the such a person, uh, that was a Dong Shan uh, teaching to. Dong Shan Tozan, uh, one of the founders of Soto Zen in China, to have such a thing, you must be such a person. If you were such a person, what interest would you have in having such a thing? So it kind of puts the onus where it is that um, this is not something we achieve or accomplish, this is something we are, and something we we don't even become it in the sense, but we recover, we recover it. Um, to become something means we've changed from what we already are. To be such a person, to have such a thing, you must be such a person. So it's a very um, simple way of pointing our experience back to our own, our, our so-called awakening or insight back to our own experience in, in, in Zen, particularly in Zazen. So this is a um, uh, universally instructed, uh, recommended instructions for Zazen, so it's pointing directly at, at the practice of Zazen. Anyone else hear anything that stood out for them? I know reading through it like this uh, for the first time. Um, I'm assuming that when he says, you have gained the pivotal opportunity of human form, do not pass your days and nights in vain, that means that you're at a certain level in terms of reincarnation. You didn't come back as a bug. <laughs> you know, you're, you're human. So, mm -hmm. you know, one of the, th I guess one of the things that, makes us human versus not human as you have this opportunity. Yeah, I'd like to uh, quote uh, from another translation of this, and there are many, many translations. One of the difficulties we have in studying in English is that we have so many translations of so many of these teachings that uh, it's a good idea actually to read multiple translations, and we've actually set them up in grids so that you can read across. Uh, somebody else here at this same point said, um, you already have the good fortune to be born with a precious human body, so do not waste your time meaninglessly. Though the precious uh, human form is called the pivot, the pivot point. Uh, Japanese yoki. Yoki means like the essential, right, yoki, pivot point means the essential. Kiyo is an inversion of it. But it means sort of the, um, like the sprocket of a bicycle. The essential thing that central thing that keep makes it work, keeps it running. So uh, the Buddhist um, cosmology, if you will, has the six planes from uh, Avicii hells at the bottom, two seat of heaven at the top. We have the asuras or uh, titans, angry gods, and then we have the humans, third level down, so to speak. This is a metaphor. Under that, the insect animal world, and uh, the uh, I believe it's the uh, what do we call the ones we want to feed, you know, the, the, hungry the hungry ghosts, and then the hells at the bottom. So uh, it's sort of a spectrum from unrelenting misery and chaos uh, up to human beings and then up to heaven where it's, it, everything is uh, completely peaceful. There's no stress, no, no suffering. And so human beings are seen as sort of floating in the middle there. It's not that we're the highest accomplishment of God or anything like that, but uh, we have we have a kind of stewardship of of the world that we live in. And floating in the middle, we have just enough suffering, and we have just enough uh, capacity to overcome suffering that it's possible for human beings to become enlightened. Chickens, cows, dogs, and cats, not so much. But uh, so this is the meaning of the yoki or pivot point. I think to to uh, Michael's point, Does that makes sense. Yoki. Pivot point. You you already have the 
good fortune to be born as a, in a precious human body. So do not waste your time meaningless, meaninglessly, as he says in here. So anything from you? Anything from over there? Okay. So let's go on with a couple of these. Anybody else? Anything come up? Okay. Look at the, what I want you to do is read the first section while I quote a different translation. Okay. This is a good exercise. It'll give you an idea of the effectiveness of, of, of studying multiple translations, unless you want to go back and learn the ancient Sino-Japanese. So where he says the ways are originally perfect and pervading, how could it be contingent on practice and realization and so forth? This other one says, uh, when you trace the source of the w now, it says now, now when you trace the source of the way, you find that it is universal and absolute. How could it be dependent upon practice and enlightenment? Okay, you see the difference there? The next one, he says, the true vehicle is self-sufficient. What need is there for special effort? The, the way is completely present where you are. Uh, so what, uh, what use is um, practice and enlightenment? Um, let me go back through it again. You'll have to edit this part out. <laughs> Now, when you trace, let me just quote the whole thing. Now, when you trace, now when you trace the source of the way, you find that it is universal and absolute. How can it be dependent upon practice and enlightenment? The supreme teaching is free, so why study the means to attain it? Another question. The way is completely present where you are, so what use is pursuing uh, enlightenment elsewhere? So these are three basic questions. And they're positing, or they're setting up what must have been the conventional wisdom of the time. When you trace the source of the way, you find that it is universal and absolute. How can it be dependent on practice and uh, enlightenment? So if the idea uh, prevalent at the time, and, and maybe in our time too, is that this uh, truth is dependent upon our uh, experiencing it. Uh, this is this is 180 degrees backwards. The, uh, when you trace the source of the way, you find it's universal and absolute. It's 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 a universal truth. It cannot be dependent upon our practice and enlightenment. And so here, it's perfect and all pervading. Similar words. Uh, it cannot be contingent upon what we do. So this is a very subtle but important point. I think that most of the things that we do uh, pursue in our life, we think we bring about the change by our efforts, right? And this is pointing out that this is a, a rediscovering the truth of existence that is already true, that is already pre-existent. And all we're simply doing is uncovering or returning to it. Very different attitudinal approach to, to learning. Then uh, where he says that uh, the way is completely present where you are, so of what use uh, pursuing enlightenment elsewhere? Uh, if it is universal and absolute, then it has to be here. And remember, he's just come back from a long trip to China. And so he's talking to his, uh, his students here. The reason he makes the reference to adjusting your robes is obviously this tract is for his students, uh, adjusting your robes when you sit. Uh, and he's telling them, you don't have to bother doing what I did. You don't have to go to China like I did. One of the things he learned when he went to China is that, you know, the truth was where he was in the beginning. And then after the, stating these uh, questions uh, based on, you might say, conventional wisdom of the time, where he's refuting the conventional wisdom of the time, he says, and yet if there's a hairbreadth deviation, it's like the gap between heaven and earth. And in the other translation it says, um, However, if there is the slightest differ, uh, difference between you and in the beginning, between you and the way, the result will be a greater separation than heaven and earth. And this separation of heaven and earth, again, we hear in the Chinese poems. And then if the least like or dislike arises, the mind is lost in confusion. And the other one, it says, if the slightest dualistic thinking arises, uh, you will lose your Buddha mind. So... Uh, 
Losing your Buddha mind, however, doesn't mean you permanently fall into hell or into uh, complete ignorance. It just means in that moment, that's not the Buddha mind. Slightest dualistic thinking arises, that's not the Buddha mind. However, the Buddha mind, we would have to say, encompasses that. So um, the issue as to whether we think or don't think, not thinking versus thinking, uh, simply suppressing thinking is not the Buddha mind. Uh, you can think of the Buddha mind as uh, chitta bodhi. Chitta uh, means thinking mind. Right? The uh, usual survival-oriented kinds of processes that are uh, uh, discriminating mind goes through. On the other hand, uh, bodhi is called wisdom mind. You could think of bodhi as intuition, intuitive mind, uh, wisdom mind. Uh, chitta as uh, discriminating thinking mind, bodhi chitta together make up the whole of the mind. So um, when we jump down a few places here, where he says um, after he gives all the instructions on the physical posture, he says settle into steady, immovable sitting. He says uh, the other one says uh, sit firmly as a rock and think of non-thinking. Think of non-thinking. This comes from an old uh, story of a master sitting there and one of his students, the teacher is sitting in meditation and this, the student says something to him. This, this seems so alien to our way of thinking about how you, know, you would never approach somebody in meditation and disturb them, right? But uh, so here this, I think it was in China, the student says, uh, what are you thinking uh, sitting there in that mountain still state. It seemed very rude to us, you know, that you would do something like that. But the teacher immediately says, I am, I'm thinking, not thinking. And again, this is variously translated. And the student says, how can you think not thinking? And the teacher says something like, it is not thinking. So Master Dogen is referring to this story here by saying, think of not thinking, not thinking. What kind of thinking is that? Non-thinking. This is the essential art of Zazen. So it sounds like a lot of semantics, but if you, if you think about it, uh, we know when we're thinking. Uh, we know when we've been thinking for the past five minutes or so, past, past few minutes. We know when we may have been sitting for a while and not thinking about anything, no, no uh, thought process or train of thought going on. So we actually have the ability to recognize when we're thinking or not thinking. And I think what Master Dogen is pointing out here is that in the middle there, what is recognizing whether we're thinking or not thinking, is non-thinking. It's sitting without relying on thinking. Thinking may come and go, but it's just like our breath coming and going. It's the output of the brain, it's the natural function of our thinking mind. Um, natural thought in Zen is set, set up against uh, intentional thought, where if we sit for long periods of time, any period of time at all, natural thoughts will pop up. Uh, car drives by, a train goes by, a bird calls, a dog barks. The mind naturally recognizes that sound and doesn't confuse the dog barking for the bird calling, as, as uh, Banke pointed out. So this background mind is always sorting everything out for us. We, we don't have to do it consciously. This is the wisdom or intuitive mind. It's also discriminating, but it's discriminating in a different way. Uh, so if we, uh, when we sit in Zazen, we do the same thing over and over and over again. Of course, we never do exactly the same thing twice. Impossible, right? But relatively speaking, we're sitting in the same posture again and again and again. So by sheer repetition, like uh, working a muscle, lifting barbells or something, uh, a process takes place where the muscle becomes stronger. Uh, if we sit uh, long enough, still enough for long enough, and, uh, and sink into this deeper stillness, then it becomes very clear when we're thinking, when we're not thinking. It becomes very clear when we're thinking what we're actually thinking about because we're beginning to observe our thoughts as if they are thought by somebody else and we're listening to these thoughts come from somebody else. Then we begin to see that they're basically the same kind of thoughts coming around again and again and again. Some teachers recommend pigeonholing them. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, you know, work, money, zen, kids, family, whatever pigeonholes, you maybe have a dozen pigeonholes. You begin to see that your the thinking process is kind of an auto autopilot kind of thing. It's it's uh, 
It's, uh, it's going to continue whether you want to think about anything or not. It's like breathing. Breathing is going to continue whether you want to make the body breathe or not. So part of our, this backward step that Master Dogen talks about in here is just realizing that we're not in control. You know, we're really, uh, this is happening whether we like it or not. And we can sit here and observe it. We can try to control it, you know, or we can disengage, take the backward step of just considering in its full fullness. Then we begin to see that thinking and non-thinking are this kind of vacillation, thinking and not thinking, this kind of vacillation that just goes back and forth, just like we may be hot, we may be cold, we may be uh, tired, we may feel elated, uh, all these vacillations that occur that we're observing in our meditation. Thinking and not thinking is one of those vacillations. So what's in between thinking and not thinking that's doing the observing? This is what he calls non-thinking. So when you come to a point of non-thinking, uh, reminds me of a t-shirt. I saw Calvin and Hobbes t-shirt where they were sledding down a hill with their eyes wide open, hands flying and so forth. And the, the caption said, brain's all empty, we don't care. It was kind of returning to original mind, a childlike mind in that sense, but with the full maturity of, of uh, hopefully, <laughs> that we've uh, developed uh, through our lifetime. So it's uh, um, relinquishing our obsessive necessity to, to think at all times. And then he goes on to say, this is the essential art of Zazen. So uh, in the other translation says, uh, this is the very basis of Zazen. So uh, if we enter into non-thinking and in uh, Zazen Shin, which some of us are familiar with here, he says, uh, essential function of Buddhas, functioning essence of ancestors, actualized within non-thinking, manifest, being manifested within non-interacting. So if you think actualized within non-thinking, he means, this is talking about Zazen Shin, it's the, the acupuncture needle of Zazen, it's again about Zazen. This is the essential function of all Buddhas in history. This is the functioning essence of our ancestral lineage, is to transmit this practice, Zazen. And then he goes on to say it's actualized within non-thinking. So he's saying the same thing he's saying here. This is the essential art of Zazen, is to enter into this uh, new normal uh, mode of mind, you might say, that you can call non-thinking. Uh, you can recognize when you're over here on the thinking side, you can recognize when you're over here on the not thinking side. But this is not preferring one over the other. It's in the middle, and thinking occurs, okay, you know, uh, fine. But if something happens, we don't have to try to think our way out of it. Uh, we might rely instead on our, on our intuition and do what seems natural at the moment instead of doing the pros and cons analysis of if I do this, you know, if I don't do that kind of thing. And so it's liberating or freeing to us in our daily lives, uh, but it has to come, come off the cushion with us. Uh, we find it on the cushion where we, we learn to observe the very function of the mind itself. Uh, in the other translation, it says, uh, think neither good nor evil, right or wrong, thus, setting, thus uh, setting aside, set aside all the functions of the mind. The natural functions of the mind is to make, the natural functioning of the mind is to make discriminations between good and evil, right and wrong. So Dogen is encouraging us, while you're on the cushion, stop doing that. You know, see if you could stop doing it or witness your mind doing it. You can't stop doing it unless you can see that that's what you're doing, right? So anyway, there's an awful lot can be said here, and uh, I don't want to go on and on. Um, there was a comment from online. Yes, yes, of course. Comment from online. Uh, Daikin says, I have noticed that not thinking mind, I'm sorry. I have noticed the not thinking mind, at least for me, when I sit, I have to almost make peace with not thinking, like since they sit. There's kind of a leap of trust that the thinking will stop at some point in the process. Right. In fact, Xing Xing Ming means trust in mind. So you have to, you have to develop, thinking is, is defensive, you know, mostly defensive. We're trying to think about our situation and trying to 
you know, conjure up what we can do about it, what we can do to make it better, what we can do to fix a relationship or to get a better job or whatever it happens to be. And uh, it's as if things aren't okay as they are. You know, things, there's, not, there's something wrong and I have to fix it. And I have to figure out how to fix it. And so I have to rely on thinking in order to, to do that. But this, this proposition is, is different. It's saying, not really. You know, you can just, uh, well, it's not really quite uh, Casper Milkto's lackadaisical go with the flow kind of thing. It's more like, where's your best gut level instinct? You know, what, what's the, what, what is your, your, your heart telling you to do? It, although your mind may be saying, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, right? What can you trust? Uh, so trust in mind uh, means we don't trust this, what we call monkey mind. We don't trust the monkey mind that's uh, fearful, irresolute, uh, jumping from limb to limb of the tree, always looking for something entertaining, exciting, uh, worrying, uh, planning, scheming, and so forth. That's not the mind that these great ancestors are telling us to trust. It's the sort of 600-pound gorilla that's under that mind <laughs> that we should trust. It's the mind of samadhi or the mind of balance or the mind of, you know, uh, I'm a walking dead man anyway. You know, uh, I can take a risk. Uh, so I think that's what it's getting at, psychologically to drop the defenses but it's, it's saying that we can't simply do that by changing our mind. We, sim we cannot simply make a conscious change of mind that I'm going to be more compassionate, that I'm going to be braver, or I'm going to be, you know, uh, and so forth, a better person, that kind of thing. It has to be a true change. It has to be a change that comes about on the cushion. And the be according to Zen, at least, and the beginning of it is to see that faulty discriminating mind, the mistakes we make, uh, we own up to those through the repentance and refuges. And we see that, you know, life is one long mistake, as Master Dogen's, Zen life is one long mistake, as, in, as in Master Dogen said elsewhere, fall down seven times, get up. So, unlike Oprah, this is not something we can get once and for all, and then we're, we're a changed person when we leave, leave the show that day. This is something that happens every day. We revisit these uh, truths again and again. But this is the very basis of uh, Zazen. In our Zazen, we suspend that activity. We allow it to come to an end. Uh, it's a compulsive, obsessive activity. It doesn't have to continue. It's not, not necessarily uh, our normal state of mind. It's natural, but it's not necessarily has to be our, our normal. So toward the end, I wanted to say, uh, he says, um, do not be surprised by the appearance of a real dragon, is the way it put it in the other one. Here it says, uh, do not doubt the true dragon. This is a story of the guy who collected statues and paintings of dragons and so forth until one day a real dragon heard about this and appeared through his, came through his window. <laughs> frighten him to death. Um, so the real dragon, uh, somebody said is Zazen, but I think the real dragon is something that we come to confront or uh, assimilate or face through the practice of Zazen. So you could think of it as an effect of Zazen, that we confront the real dragon. Think of what a dragon is. What was the other translation you just read for the statement about the dragon? This one says, uh, long accustomed to groping for the elephant. That's the metaphor. It feels like a snake. It feels like a tree. I mean, all the men are blind, right? This right. is one of Buddha's metaphors. Uh, long accustomed, please honored followers of Zen. Long accustomed to groping for the elephant. Do not doubt the true dragon. Okay. You had another one just a minute ago. Yeah, the other, the other uh, translation says... Um, uh, followers of Zen or Zen trainees do not be surprised by the appearance of, of a real dragon. I would interpret that as, as your shadow in Jungian terms. Yeah. I think I know what you mean. Yeah. But I, I, would, I would give it a much more visceral and literal meaning. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, there was the famous story of the dragon that Sensei tells in the Kiyosaku of the, with his English, it's funny, he says, uh, the abbot of the monastery uh, noticed that one of his ceilings had become dull. <laughs> so he decided to have a dragon painted on it. And so the word went out, he was looking for somebody to come paint a dragon. The monastery, and in the book uh, we published of these talks, we have the picture of the actual dragon that's in 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 this story, this paint this painting that is the, it's a true story. Now. So uh, one painter uh, comes to town. I think he he arranges to meet with the master in the village, and uh, I don't know if they're having lunch or whatever. And uh, at one point the abbot asks him, "Well, do you paint from uh, imagination or do you paint from real life?" <laughs> And the artist says, well, I'm afraid I have to admit I paint from imagination. I've never seen a real dragon. And so uh, the, the abbot says, well, come around to my place. There's any number of them. So uh, later on, the, the painter comes. He's going to be prepared to paint the dragon on the ceiling and so forth. And he com uh, the abbot comes out and meets him in the hall. And he said, I've come to see that dragon you were talking about. I'd like to see him. And so, well, can't you see them? The hall is full of them. Can't you see them? I had to admit he couldn't see the dragons. So he said, well, sit here till you do. So the story goes, he sits and practices Zazen with the abbot for some period of time. And then one day, the artist comes running into the abbot's room and says, I see what you mean. I've seen the dragon. I, I saw the dragon. And the abbot says, did you hear him roar? <laughs> he goes back to sit. So eventually he paints this dragon. It's a very vital, live feeling dragon. And Sensei would use that uh, living Zen, or uh, the stone in the garden is alive. He would use that metaphor. If you think of a dragon, it represents a lot of things. And the Mokugyo fish drum is two dragon heads biting a ball, right? The ball is uh, water. The dragon has found water, as he's saying here. So the water quenches the dragon's thirst. Um, so here the dragon, if you think of a dragon, they're kind of electrical, they're like snapping and, and the fire flashing. Uh, you know, fire breathing and so forth. Uh, they're at one and the same time a symbol of thirst or craving, right? Uh, in unquenchable thirst. And at the same time, they're this, this incredible symbol of life or vitality. In the martial arts, the dragon is a very potent symbol where you, you become the dragon through your training. You, you tap into the uh, power of ki, right? Or the, what's it called in yoga? The kundalini. You know, uh, naga, snake, snake, uh, power, dragon. So this uh, this image is one that's conjured for us to uh, give an impression of what awakening uh, must be like. It must be like awakening to the dragon. Do not be surprised by the appearance of a real dragon. So that's my gloss on it, anyway. So let's stop there and see if anybody has something to say. So just to close, um, toward the end of this, um, he says, uh, or well, he goes, devoting your energies to the way, um, trying to remember the other translation. Succeed to the enlightenment, succeed to the awakening of the ancestors. If you do Zazen for some time, you will realize all this. The treasure house will then open of itself, and you will be free to enjoy it to your heart's content. So it's kind of a global promise of a benefit of the practice. And uh, here uh, he makes the statement that you you should know or you must you must know that uh, this is something that will happen of itself and so where we speak of non-thinking it's not exactly the end of thinking uh, but it's uh, uh, sort of putting thinking in its place where we begin to have a better balance between citta, bodhi, 
better balance between thinking our way to enlightenment or uh, allowing enlightenment to come to us rather than pursuing it. Uh, the backward step is turning our usual uh, learning process around where we let this come to us. If you do Zazen for some time, you will realize all this. The treasure house will open of itself. You will be free to enjoy it to your heart's content. So it not only is non-thinking, but for this transformation to come about in your experience, it is a form of non-doing. You cannot do this. We, we can't do it. What we can do is we can do Zazen. We can set the platform, Samadhi, setting the platform for Kinsho, seeing into the nature or awakening. But we cannot make awakening happen. We cannot do that. So, you know, that's where it starts to lap over a little bit into religious ideas of being in a state of grace, having on the proper raiment, uh, having, you know, put ourselves through the necessary prerequisite, uh, disabusing ourselves of our own ignorance and opinions to where one day it can dawn on us suddenly the truth of this teaching. Uh, but it requires that we turn around our way of approaching so that we're, as Uchiyama Roshi says, opening the hand of thought. Matsuoka Roshi said, if you grasp the incense, smoke it evades the grasp. If you stop, it embraces your palm. So it's a very kind of non-aggression pact <laughs> that, we, that we set with reality. Uh, we open up our mind to it so it, can, so it can happen, but we can't make it happen. Well, this seems to be a main, a main part of the message here and for all the Chinese ancestors as well.